All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, tonight, we are joined by three incredible poets. Uh, tonight, we have Susan Wynn, the author of Dear Diaspora, Sarah Sams, the author of Adam City, and Bo Schwabacher, the author of Oma, Sea of Joy, and Other Astrological Signs. Uh, we're going to be ending tonight with a brief 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of the poets, leave them in the YouTube chat box and I will make sure they get asked. Um, and a little bit about our poets before we begin. Susan Nguyen hails from Virginia, but currently lives and writes in Arizona. She earned her MFA in poetry from Arizona State University, where she won the Alita Rodriguez Memorial Prize and fellowships from the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. In 2018, PBS NewsHour named her one of three women poets to watch. Her work appears in Diagram, Tin House, and elsewhere. She writes a lot about identity, the body, and the Vietnamese diaspora, and also likes to make scenes. Her debut collection, Dear Diaspora, won the 2020 Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and comes out in September 2021. Visit her at susanpoet.com. Sarah Sams is a writer from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. She's currently researching the influence particle physics has had on contemporary poetics and learning how to be a mom. Sarah has spent much of the past decade in Arizona and teaches writing at the University of Arizona. Between 2013 and 2016, she received fellowships to teach at the National University of Singapore and for the Ministry of Education in Logroño, Spain. A graduate of Davidson College and Arizona State University, her poems and translations have appeared in Blackbird, The Volta, Matter Monthly, The Drunken Boat, Now and Then, The Appalachian Magazine, and elsewhere. You can find her work online at sarahesams.com. Uh, last but not least, Bo Schwabacher is a South Korean adoptee. Born in South Korea, she was adopted at three months old. Bo grew up in Illinois. Her poems have appeared in Cha, Cut Bank, Diode, The Offing, and others. Um, and then before we get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to our partner for this event. This event is part of the 24th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. This annual free festival is the Utah Humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. And the complete program is available at utahhumanities.org. Our thanks to the book festival's major sponsors, George S. and Dolores Dorr Eccles Foundation, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Fund, Summit County RAP, Weber County Ramp, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the King's English Bookshop, Weller Bookworks, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Catalyst. Um, and we would also like to give the following land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. Tribes that have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. We acknowledge this history to honor and respect the indigenous communities still connected to the land on which we gather. Um, and finally, if you enjoy what you hear tonight, please consider supporting the poets by buying their books. And please consider supporting our bookstore by buying them through us. And I'll leave links where you can do so in the chat box and video description. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm going to turn the time over to these three wonderful poets. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much, um, Salem, for having us. And also, thank you, Weller Bookworks and the Utah Humanities Book Festival. It's my honor to be reading with Susan Nguyen and celebrating her book launch and book tour. Um, Dear Diaspora is amazing. And I'm also thrilled to be here with Sarah Sams. I'll be reading from my book, Oma, Sea of Joy, and Other Astrological Signs. Luck of the Rabbit and Blood Type AB. My family consisted of a dragon, a tiger, and a rat. I was a rabbit from Korea with AB positive blood, which means when I found a baby rabbit near the childhood fence, I thought my mother would save it. The dragon and the tiger were constantly fighting while the rat self-destructed in very clever ways. I was soft as a bun in a hot metal tin wheeled to the next table for the next hungry family. The Outer Banks, Last Family Road Trip. 
I slept in a bathtub in a Motel 6. I slept at the Virginia diner over biscuits and gravy. I slept through the Smoky Mountains, my father recalling his red college hallucinations like a somniloquy. My parents drove in separate cars. They said aloud this vacation was for their children as if children enjoy being around drunk, collapsing adults who tally what each person owes for groceries and rum. My brother nodded to the reasoning of wrecked fools, even though he was better at algebra. I hoped that fluorescence was just an invention meant to make workers believe it is daylight, to forget that they can walk outside at any time with coffee, styrofoam vision, and be honest goodness across continental airwaves, even to their children, caramel, foam tenderness. They can say, I'm broken, we're broken. How did you sleep? How to love an adopted Korean girl. Take pictures of her in the dark when the moon is almost full on the verge of an eclipse. Ask her if she sees the rabbit. Show her there are two ways of looking at almost everything. She will find her way home by eating pumpkin porridge. She will realize her roots by remembering she came to America on tiny boat shoes. Her mother is beautiful, you know, because she was born from the same heartbeat, an intelligence reserved for the soft-spoken. Bring tangerines and light citrus spritz on fire to get a better look at her eyes. She will smell like forgetfulness and dank oil, the neck, is a cradle. She will love you if you stay, if you promise you have never left. I wrote this poem when I was searching for my birth mother. Um, like many adoptees, I began the search and I hoped to find her and I was waiting. Magunghua. I meet my birth mother in August when Magunghua blossoms. This is what I hope for at least. The flower withstands rust and smuts. It is the end of August now and I am waiting. Will she want to meet me? Is she alive? Maybe it would be more auspicious to meet in October, the end of a season, two months after she had given birth. She gave me to a taxi driver and his family for safekeeping, placed like a poem, looking for an audience, a reader to say, I see you and I will hold you between my fingers like a delicate pulpwood treasure. An adopted Korean girl's Korean bathing secrets. I am closing my ways out. My hair is brushed. Here are other women's hands and me walking down the street. My bloodline is fragrant with rose and I need you to comb your fingers across my scalp. An adopted Korean girl soberness. A hundred percent Asia East, I bled and worried. I slept in the fetal position and learned how to eat a bony fish, how to chase love. A bruised moon is yellowed tinfoil. I was left with men like my father and a fistful of corn pops. What could I do? but bleed. And this is the last poem I'll read tonight. Um, during my search, I decided to go back to my birthplace. And before I left, I learned that my birth mother was um, dead. She passed away when she was around 28. An adopted Korean girl's New Year's wish for her birth mother. What else does an orphan girl have? Whomever I'm with, I please. Brave Oma were outcasts, and Ajuma is selling cigarettes next to the place we were last together. A ghost is blessing my cakes. I'm steaming my misshapen Sangpyeong over pine needles. This earthy real grief was our beginning. As an animal, I need to be held. Beauty is a feeling. Thank you. I always, the silence after Zoom reading, I want to clap really loudly. That was so beautiful. Thanks for sharing your poems, Bo. I, I'm especially catching on to the phrase, there's always two ways of looking, or there's two ways of looking at almost everything. Um, that's great. So I'm Sarah. I'm so thankful to be here. Thank you to Weller Bookworks and to the Utah Humanities Book Festival. 
Um, I'm originally from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and a lot of my, the poems in Adam City are um, about, oops, there we go, I already did it, <laughs> are about um, growing up in a town designed to enrich the uranium for the atomic bomb. Um, so you should be able to see some pictures here that I'm going to share with you. Um, I just want to give you some context um, of the Manhattan Project and don't be embarrassed if it's something that you don't know a lot about because the culture of secrecy that um, was purposefully curated during World War II around the project of developing the atomic bomb um, persists today, I really think. Um, and so Oak Ridge, the town where I'm from, didn't exist as a town until the government designated it as um, just an ideal spot to to enrich to build factories and just insane amount of development really rushed way um to enrich the uranium for the nuclear bomb so there's a map that you can see i just present this so you can see a little more clearly um of the original sort of schema for the city um, of oak ridge tennessee <clears throat> and the first poem that i'm going to read is inspired by uh, a billboard from this home, my hometown. <laughs> the pictures that you'll see as they come up, um, think of them as maybe kind of part of the poems. You don't have to read them closely, um, but take in the visual along with the, the words. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold, so. But think, are you authorized to tell it? I didn't know the secret we kept when I lived in the town where quiet vines thread trees in winter. Now I visit every year to see the crumpet creeper gone brown and the kudzu like dead party streamers. And today there was a squirrel eyeing me from his side the way a squirrel must. He clattered on the roof and called for me to speak more plainly. So I'll shoot for pared down, a small phrase to hold and turn over, a coin with two sides, cool and smooth and seductive, like security. You could bite the coin to test the secret or lay it on an eye as you sleep just for the quality of the image. Electrons dance inside metal like dreams. Walking deep through Greenway Trail, I listen to the story of Tsutomu who made it home from Nagasaki to Hiroshima after one white flare just in time to see the second. Then I sit on a root shiny with sap from a higher wound, tooth down on what I meant to share with you. The hard coin whirs against my tongue. I don't believe I've ever been quiet just because I was told. Appraisal report, single atom and an ion trap after the photo by David Nadlinger. Emitting just the right blue violet light, not this blue, not this violet, not this blue, not this violet. Blue and violet like irradiated want, like Taco Bell, like fattened acid sliding down my throat. I catch on motionless on what I bulge up and pull everything the sea is not. Motionless pricks, motionless is rigid clamp, is out of time. I buoy my worry like a cross stitch set against the lure, cross stitch blue as the houses of my hormones, peptide honeycombs, pristine chambers, complicated trash put out back. Spec better than the purple squish consolidating at the nave of the toilet. Speck of endless voraciousness to make, to have. Speck that urges me to say multitudinous, the word in my mouth nearly motionless, nearly seen. Speck almost what I want it to be, the image from a song we once sang, particle man, particle man. The idea of scope spreading in my nine-year-old brain, like mold, like rot on a banana. Deploying. Every use 
becomes a metaphor for using. Every metaphor for using becomes a reason for using, a link in the chain that has evolved into a chain of pure thought, a chain that fattens or shrinks as a thought may fatten or shrink any moment, untouched as it goes in the grove of the mind. <clears throat> Each tree makes way for the next while managing to feed itself fully on the light. Wait, were we speaking of metal, of wood? Am I lost? That's the goal. After all, the word Manhattan is a woman wishing so much for affection that no one will give her any. And for added irony, the general's home address. Reorient, as he would say, recast necessary but unsavory violations of logic. Not see what is possible, but see what is possible through. Seen through his language environments have grown greedy speak nuclear heritage, define bomb as birthright. Ask, was your grandfather in the war? Does your dad work at the lab? Why are you writing about this again? <coughs> this poem is called Decayed Gazal and it's um, loosely, well, so I took the Arabic po poetic form of a ghazal and then couldn't do it. So <laughs> decayed ghazal. The law of conservation of parody was wrong. Chen Cheng proved so. The men she proved so for won the Nobel Prize for Chen Cheng. A novelty, calen novelty calendar teaches me her name. She helped us fuel the bomb, understand decay, Inherently likable in its cobalt furs, Chen Cheng's beta decay says scintillator, and yet stays far away from issues of consent. Conservation of parody trusts in nature to be symmetrical, in agreement with itself. How like a mime you raise your glass and I raise mine. How in the mirror I'm berating myself, berating myself uniformly. Only we're zoomed way in now and I never took physics. I always wanted my head spun around in other ways. But now I want to know, is there a problem to chew on so tasty? I might, to my very last, doubt. I want to see my mouth still puckering, cosmological constant a candy in my mouth, before two chalkboard bulbs that bob the thought of particles. Don't they look like surly clowns? I think they would laugh if they could at their jumbo size their chalky solidity, at my funny little need to know, and me plumbing me still up until the very last. Okay, well, thank you. Um, did I stop sharing the screen? I think that I did. Okay, <laughs> great. You did. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you Salem for introducing us up earlier um, and just working with us um, and while our book works to get this event going um, and for believing in our books. Um, Bo and Sarah, thank you for your beautiful readings. Bo, I'm holding on to the line, beauty is a feeling. Um, and for you, Sarah, I think the line was the title, um, but think, are you authorized to tell it? Um, I think that is the first book, I'm sorry, first poem or one of the first poems in your collection, which is such a strong way to open. Um, yes, I'm right. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I can really relate th to that too, just because of the amount of research and history, um, archival work that I know I've done a lot in my own work. Um, but think, are you authorized to tell it? And I don't think I've ever been told. Um, I've ever been quiet just because I'm told. So thank you all for reading your poems. I was taking a lot of, a lot of notes um, in terms of what y'all read. Um, and Bo and Sarah, I know we're not all in the same city right now, but I met both of you um, in our time in Arizona, where I'm still at. So I feel like this is a Southwestern reunion. So we all have our debut poetry collections coming out, or that came out this year. So this is so exciting to just be sharing the same space with you all. I'm excited to talk um, and converse after my reading as well. Um, so my collection, Dear Diaspora, came out um, about a week and a half ago. Um, I, I, Really, the collection was my way of um, processing and exploring the Vietnamese diaspora, which you know I'm a part of. Um, so for me, 
in my collection, I'm, I'm writing poems about a character, a protagonist named Susie with an I. Um, so I have some third person poems about Susie, Susie with an I, her experience really growing up in Amer suburbia, America, um, and kind of dealing with growing up, but also missing father, the diaspora, what it means to be a member of that. And then I have some poems in this older I voice um, that kind of allows her to speak more directly to the diaspora um, in a more maybe reflective or at least a different way um, than maybe some of the third person poems. So probably gonna read a little bit of everything. Um, and I'm gonna start my timer. And the first poem I want to read is called Cicada Summer. Um, as Salem mentioned earlier, I'm from Virginia, so the East Coast, just like Sarah. Um, my background is a picture of um, green fireflies because I was really missing those um, from Virginia because in Arizona, we don't really have fireflies, unfortunately. Um, in this poem, I was kind of thinking of you know, the cicadas that come up, I think it's, it's in every seven years maybe, um, and kind of that was one of the inspirations, um, the starting points for, for this poem. Cicada Summer. The cicadas come from the ground and enter the world in currents, streaming down tree trunks, over branches, across sidewalks and roads, the males pulsing their abdomens, singing for sex. In the field behind the school, Susie and her classmates stand still as dozens climb over their bodies, careful not to crush the winged insects beneath their feet, fearful of littering the ground with broken glass. Susie collects every wing she can find. Each one becomes a small body of water she carries in her pocket, a broken window pane she holds to each eye. She counts dozens more on her way home and imagines how they would taste. Hands in her pockets, touching the wings to each fingertip, she wonders, would they still sing on the way to death? And would it sound any different? Today, she walks through uneven fields of green and spits into tall grass, the roots of trees, listens as the clicking of cicadas fills her body with song. The green lacerates her ankles and she imagines her blood mixed with dirt will nourish, will add to the muscle tremor of the earth. The last time she saw him. The last time she saw him was after dinner, washing the dishes. Her mother had brought home rice, vermicelli soup and patty crabs. This wasn't her father's first disappearance. Sometimes Susie couldn't tell when he disappeared from when he left for fishing trips on the coast, when he stayed out all night and went to work after sleeping in the car or no sleep at all. But always he materialized in a few days or a week from the broken down cardboard boxes and crushed pistachios in his car, $1 scratch offs and green green grass emerged her father, dark and sinewy, mouth full of resin. The first language, one. Behind the church, we ran through labyrinths of poplar and hickory, dirt paths cutting through ravines in the backs of suburban homes, the brick patios and striped furniture. In the green light of summer, we loved getting lost, how we could step into woods and exit in a cul-de-sac eight blocks away. Loved it best when tadpoles formed a halo around our toes, two. Before he disappeared, my father taught me how to catch tadpoles in my hand. The trick wasn't just to stay still, but to stop breathing. He caught dozens like this, knees bent and pant legs folded, his face inches above the creek. He taught me that our first language was named after tadpoles, the way they moved through water, a knife dissecting the stratosphere, a voice cutting quiet. Three. My third favorite memory of him is walking hand in hand on two lane roads, identifying Virginia trees. In one pocket, a zodiac sign lighter, a button for mother's favorite blouse, and the other, acorns for burying. I can still identify the red oaks. Four, today the tadpoles flow through my fingers like an egg yolk, and my impulse is to cradle one in my mouth. The tadpole swims circles and my tongue follows, mapping its movement for spitting. So it's titled my collection um, is Dear Diaspora. 
Um, I have a series of poems throughout the collection um, called Letter to the Diaspora, and each one begins with Dear Diaspora. Um, they all started out as one serial poem, um, and over time I realized they needed to kind of stand alone and you know, be worked on separately. Um, so this is the first one that appears in the collection. Letter to the Diaspora. Dear Diaspora, I believe in the American dream. Strike through. Last night I had the American dream. In the dream I had an indoor pool. In the dream I walked my dead dog with a diamond leash. I ate a greasy burger with my perfect hands. I had the most beautiful sex. My skin was smooth, alabaster as the moon. In the morning, everything had changed. There was no pool, only twine for drying clothes. The dead remained dead. My perfect hands held nothing. Nothing was better. All right. Um, about midway through my collection, I have a longer um, section serial poem called The Boat People. Um, so I'm gonna read a few parts of that and kind of jump around since it's a longer, longer poem. The Boat People. She Googles FOB after someone calls her fresh off the boat. She's never been on a boat. What she finds, blank deaths from blank to blank blank memorials in blank countries. On open water, they traveled on small fishing junks, origami boats, arms and legs folded one over the other, trawlers smuggling thousands of bodies, searching for international water, living on empty for weeks and months, looking for coastline that did not push back. Vietnamese Boat People Memorial, Asian Garden of Peaceful Eternity. Westminster Memorial Park. The man and old woman, the young mother and child, frozen in bronze, turned blue-green, four figures so soaked they have become the waterlogged wrinkles of their clothing, four figures on the raft, floating in a fountain shaped like the body of a boat, their bodies submerging above water, the young woman's outstretched hand reaching back in time around the fountain lay 54 stones, each inscribed with names, a small, a small portion of the dead. The people smugglers speak. They come to us with black market gold, whole life savings, home sold, they the soon to be defectors. They will say they're going on holiday or nothing at all. They, they will disappear in the middle of the night walk through mud and green jungle, reappear in the darkest morning. Some commission their own boats built, traveling petri dish of human waste, fever dream. We know men who have tried to leave many times only to be turned back, bad weather, bad feeling. They will not give up. They would squander their life savings a dozen times, anything for the chance of freedom, the promise of blue ocean. I'm just gonna read one more section. Can you define a refugee? A refugee seeks refuge. Interview number six. I did not want to go back. When they took us to the plane, it was over very quick. We owned almost nothing still after seven years. The men brought their fists together, desperate. We dragged our feet, refused to walk, threw our bodies against their barricade were met with water cannon. The men were rolled into blankets, loaded into the cabin like a cigarette in the plane's mouth, a stilled bullet. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna invite Bo and Sarah back onto the virtual stage. Um, we're gonna have a little conversation before we open it up to any questions the audience may have. Um, Susan, your reading was gorgeous and Sarah, yours was so stunning. I loved your visuals. So I have the first question. Um, how does the idea or feeling of freedom come through in your work? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Susan, do you want to speak to that since you just had some beautiful lines about that in the boat people? Sure. Um, yeah, I can go first. <laughs> I was holding <laughs> out. <laughs> um, 
I think, I guess my initial response or thought in terms of the idea of freedom, um, I grew, I think I spent most of my life to this point kind of just not really focus or really pushing away my Vietnamese identity. So I didn't know much, you know, some of the history that I just read in that book, People Poem, um, came about through the process of writing this collection and trying to process and understand my own identity and, you know, where my community came from. Um, I think a lot of times when people think of Vietnam, they think of the Vietnam War, um, the boat people, right? A lot of trauma and pain, which is valid and very true and is real. Um, that's not all there is, of course, but I think I needed to dig into that for myself because I spent so long denying that part of myself and just trying to assimilate, honestly. So there was so much I didn't know and so many questions I I didn't even have because I didn't know how to formulate or what questions I had. Yeah. So I think there was definitely freedom in writing poetry to come, you know, to discover some of this and to come to what those questions may be, um, which I know I've said before, but now that this book is out and I've had some distance from it, I'm like realizing all that too, right? Um, and I think like Viet Thanh Nguyen has this really great line that I'm not going to get totally right, but I think <coughs> something like, you know, wars are lived twice, right? Like once on the battlefield, mm -hmm. battlefield and another time like in memory. Um, so I think another element of freedom for me is writing in the third person about like through a character, Susie, um, mm -hmm. like that definitely was opened up some doors for me in my own writing and dealing with memory or lack of memory. And like, where do I go from there? Right. Because this isn't necessarily my lived experience, but clearly it impacts me and my community. And even if I didn't live through it or have the memories. Um, so not all the persons are about, or not all the poems are in third person, but I think having a character that was a really good starting point for me and was like freeing, I think, in, in the process of writing this. Um, but what about you two? I just want to say really quickly that those poems, Susie with an I, are so moving um, because you get a sense of how yourself as a child is kind of like stuck and like trying to navigate and learn between like trying to learn how to how to exist, how to be a human, what we always try to learn. And there's a lot of commentary that happens in those poems as she's trying to learn. So you get the like dramatic tension of interactions with her parents and her friends and and um, schoolmates, right? It's just I'm like really well done. Um, I feel like I'm like dropped into a, a lawn with fireflies, like watching you learn how to be. It's so cool. Um, I would say that if, if though, if you mean like, what, what does it mean to be free to like think, free to write, free to speak? Um, then I think <laughs> like trying to understand particle physics has really humbled me. <laughs> my understandings to perceive and to like take stock in my own perceptions, right? Because I mean, from my like basic school girl understanding of Einstein's relativity theories and the way part of like, subatomic particles behave it really underscores the idea that reality is is relativistic right there is no the way things are there is just the way that you see things are um and at the grander scale like if you zoom out even time isn't a constant so i guess that's freeing in a way um but i also think it creates kind of like a moral imperative to note that you're observing the way you're observing and that the way you observe the world affects the world and even what you're writing about so um, obviously I had a lot of like, um, moral conundrums writing my book because it's about inheriting violence. Right. Um, and I, I think particle physics really helped me do that because it helped me understand, I, I that might sound cuckoo, <laughs> but it really did help me understand not only the science of feeling the bomb, but also like um, you know, that it's okay to admit my limited role in it and to try to understand it as such. Um, coming to terms with your nuclear heritage is a long um, series of poems in my book um, that I guess would kind of complement Dear, Di Dear Diaspora in terms of like, they used to be one long poem, but then I broke them up. Um, so like maybe the heartbeat of, of the poem. Um, I hope that answers your question. I might've taken it off on a, on a wild ride. <laughs> Yeah, um, should I ask one? Yeah, go do ahead. Do you want to speak to it? Do you want to speak to it too? Because I'd love yeah, to hear. Yeah, no, I want to hear. I want to hear your answer. 
relate to what you're both saying as far as talking about inheritance and talking about memory and the way that we observe whether it's the present or the past. And I think just an element of my writing was thinking about my birth mother's life and the experience that she may have had as a Korean woman. And so um, I, I resonated with what you all were saying. But go ahead. Yeah, so I'm really curious um, it seems like you both did research um, on histories that are like very intimate, like very important and intimate to you. So I'm curious, like what the research process was like um, and how it impacted the writing process. I don't know, just loose open question about research and poems. <laughs> I can go first. So for me, um, I started to do some research as an adoptee with trying to find my birth mother. So I looked into my birth records and then I found the, um, the village where I was from. So I started researching that area and then I, I went there and I also um, went to an orphanage and spent some time there. It was an orphanage nearby the village where I was born. Um, and when, once I did that, I tried to learn more about my records within that small village. And I got to know some of the people um, who lived there and I tried to find the midwife who delivered me, but I found one of her relatives. So um, that was part of my research, but it was really, it was hard and it was really meaningful for me to physically be in those different spaces. Um, yeah, I can jump in on this one too. Um, I think, I'm trying to think, because it's been a while since I did like some of that hardcore research, because I was in grad school when I wrote um, a lot of this book, and I won't say I had more time, but my time was spent very differently. I think I had more time to sustain deep research um, than maybe I do right now. Um, but on one hand, you know, I did have a fellowship. Um, to work on the manuscript and part of that money was used to um like conduct a, a kind of an oral history project um or at least the beginnings of one and interview family members um starting with my own parents and then other extended family as well um so some of that i know is definitely sprinkled throughout the book and the boat people like just some small details you know um that um that was really i mean one eye-opening and also painful um, experience, but also like brought me closer to family. Because again, I feel like I didn't grow up hearing this, maybe not because it wasn't talked about because it was, but I don't think it was talked about like to me as a child, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I heard things about it, but you know, as a kid kind of running around, just hanging around with my cousins, like we were not paying attention, right? We were just doing our own thing growing up um, as like kids in America. Um, so I learned a lot of things that if I hadn't asked, like wouldn't have been said, like wouldn't have been shared, um, which to me is like yeah. wild, right? That there's all this knowledge and memory history, but living, you know, and that I know, right. but I wouldn't have known otherwise um, if it wasn't for the book and really poetry, right? Even if it didn't become this book. And then on the other hand, my research was literally me Googling stuff. There are a few poems um, that are called yeah. You Google Vietnam that is like, you the audience but also like the speaker which was like also inspired from me literally googling like so what is this like you know like I didn't know um there are so many things I still don't know of, of course but um like googling things and kind of going down rabbit holes and sometimes on Yahoo answers um which is like a weird space <laughs> to be in but like you know there, there was just so many rabbit holes I kind of followed and even if it was okay this got me one line or like these four hours got me like these three words I really needed like that of course was worth it to me um and I think that's kind of the nature probably of some of the writing like the research like okay I got the one line out of all of this right um, or the one tidbit of knowledge that maybe percolates and shows up later which I feel like happens a lot for me like I hear something or yeah. learn something and then it's not until much later that I'm like oh like this is like where I'm pulling it out now and this poem I'm writing much later um, but yeah, I actually learned that I really enjoy doing research, um, especially yeah. for writing, you know, when something I am really, um, interested in or, um, passionate about, or just have some, there's some stake there, you know, um, yeah. yeah. What about you, Sarah? I know you mentioned particle physics, but I don't know what else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, 
I just want to say like in response to both of you that that's like a really, I don't know, compelling call to ask questions, especially like, um, you know, about the histories of, of people we know and love and ourselves, like sometimes it can feel awkward to open, open those doors um, and step into the past with people that you, you know very well, right? Um, and, and people that are connected to you. I just, I just feel like it's really inspiring. I bet everyone listening has some questions that like sort of sit in their heart that, that they can like, you know, take out into the world um, and spend some good time with. Um, I, I read the one book that I'll mention because it was like, I did a lot of, I did a lot of the Googling. I did a lot of, I did like some archival research. I don't have a background in that. So it's just like, whatever, like looking through declassified documents from DOE, um, like what the department of energy, like whatever it is that I could do. But, um, I found that historians already did a lot of that. <laughs> and I found a great book by the historian, Peter Bacon Hales, and he really looks at the spaces of the Manhattan Project. So Oak Ridge, Hanford and Los Alamos and analyzes them like poetically and beautifully. So I, he really did the bulk of the work for me in terms of looking at the like cultural history of my town that I didn't know, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was really fun. And I've, I've tried and tried to like wrap my head around the fact that like, you know, the way that reality at the small subatomic level, how it is and how little we know. <laughs> and that like, just that's so many rabbit holes. Like I won't even try to open them here. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, I've been noticing that a lot of poets and this is, I mentioned in my bio, thank you Salem for mentioning that, that a lot of poets um, are really like, and also inspired by particle physics because of like the idea of the observer effect, right? We're obsessed with the way language affects what we're writing about. That's why we're using poetry to do it. And um, so, yeah, now I'm, now I'm kind of like looking at poets from the last of, like 50 years to see how after the development of the atomic bomb, but also like just like the wealth of knowledge that we've gained in terms of the nature of reality, how it's impacting poets. And, that's really fun for me. Um, yeah, I'll end there because I, I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> uh, I can ask the next one. We've, I mean, everyone has kind of mentioned place in some way, maybe not explicitly um, already um, in terms of research or, you know, what is inspiring um, or shows up in your poetry, but how has place or the idea of place influenced or shaped your, your poetry and your writing and your your research. Oh, you want to go for it? Yeah, sure. I think for me, um, being an adoptee, I was adopted as an infant, and then I grew up in Illinois. And so I spent a lot of time being separate or feeling separate from my Korean roots, my her Korean heritage. And um, like you were saying, Susan, there is this whole exploration of identity. And I think that I explored um, in my writing a loss of identity or a search for identity and trying to find some kind of groundedness in wherever I was. Um, but I definitely think that there was a separation between um, where I felt I had come from and so many questions and unknowns about Korea and where I actually <coughs> was. Well, um, Illinois felt very strange to me and that takes a role in my writing. How about you guys? Oh, I'm sorry. I coughed into the mic without muting it right as you were speaking. Um, you know, I'll just say briefly that I feel like much more connected to my my hometown, um, to Oak Ridge after writing the book, like for the better and the worse. So like that's kind of the outcome of this experiment for me. I think my 20s were full of and my teens, like leaving home from 18 until about maybe 28 when I started this book just full of denial. Like I wanted to write about everything else. I wanted to write about like artwork in Spain. I wanted to, you know, like, and it just like dawned on me after a poetry writing prompt in grad school where I met Susan that like, oh, I guess I have to like kind of go back home and like figure out like why I have this knot in my stomach and like try to untangle it a little bit. Um, so I think it was really, and, and also it, it, just in terms of place, Susan, like, Oh my gosh, the Im y'all's imagery is so beautiful. I don't have Bill's book yet. I'm so excited to read it though. 
um, I just started reading Susan's book and I just feel like I'm transported to Virginia summer. Like, I just feel, I just feel like I'm there. And I think like the landscape of your childhood, whether it be Illinois or Korea or Virginia, like it's just in your subconscious in a way that nothing else is, right? So I love, I love seeing that brought to the forefront um, and seeing the emotional resonance of, like, I hope that's in my book too, alongside all the weird finds poems. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely, um, thank you, Sarah. That was a wonderful compliment. Um, I'm glad you feel transported, but I feel that way in reading your book too. And I don't know, I, we're both from the East Coast. So like some some of the landscape that appears, you know, yeah. um, and the talking of place, even if it's not explicitly, not super explicit, like just the things that pop up to me, I'm like, oh, I like, I get the feeling like of this t- little town um, on the East Coast. Um, and before I guess I even want to like approach answering this, um, Sarah, like when did you first, like was, was there a moment when you found out or was it just kind of this feeling? And then over time you're like, wait, you figured it out? Or like, how did you come to this? <laughs> it's like, it's so difficult to describe the like culture of overwhelming pride that Oak Ridgers have in being from this town. And like, if I like look back at my college essay, I wrote a, like, I was a metaphor. The metaphor was like, I am like an atomic, um, <laughs> what is it? I'm like a, a radioactive element <laughs> like I think that was the wow. metaphor I use it's like our, our high school has the atom sign as the the symbol it's like it's so ubiquitous that I just like did not and that like look at it I like it's like it's eyewash and actually eyewash is one of the techniques that General Groves the director of the Manhattan Project later on like speaks to explicitly like if something is so common no one talks about it like that's why it was called the Manhattan Project because Manhattan is like everyone knows Manhattan but is it in Manhattan <laughs> like no it like just sort of like redirects your attention right um but so I think I don't know somehow writing I kept writing about the Spanish war isn't that interesting like the civil war in Spain I mean I probably because I was reading Spanish literature um was one thing that I studied but I just kept trying coming back to figures from from a history that like felt really distant for me but the themes were war and violence and I just remember like having a prompt to write a Sestina and you know forms can be really helpful that way like when you like sort of turn off it's like sort of automatic writing right it allows you to like channel your subconscious and in this form like this one form prompt that we had I, I was writing about a figure from my hometown and his role in prophesizing the nuclear bomb and I was like oh that's what I've really been that's what I need to think about <laughs> that's it <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, hi Salem. <laughs> um, please finish. I, I do have a few questions for all of oh. y'all, but like finish up your thoughts and everything. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, um, continue. Yeah. Okay. What was I going to say? Um, well, I guess first off, like Sarah, I totally relate to you because I didn't know I was going to write this book um, or like focus so much on the Vietnamese diaspora. And it makes sense now, but I spent a lot of time when I first got into poetry and in the beginning of the MFA writing about being a woman, my body, and like sexism, and being as out eyes, and like that, you know, the body yeah. in that sense, you know, and occasionally it'd be like sad, like family poem, you know, that was not that good. So I was like, whatever. Um, and then as I got more, um, spent more time writing, and then I was like, oh, I, this keeps popping up for a yeah. reason. There's a lot of stuff I gotta process um, and figure out, and that, you know, is still ongoing, of course. Um, but yeah, I feel that way too. Like, let me write about all this other stuff. Um, so I feel like my the poems in this book are so different from, I don't know, what I was writing even a few years ago when I started my MFA. Um, and then just to touch upon place, I think I'm realizing that my like landscape, you know, um, is so like imagery of landscape and all that stuff is so connected to memory scape for me. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why like it comes up so much. Um, so I'm glad that you feel like, oh, Virginia like I'm feeling that I'm seeing that um so I'm glad to hear that just because the two are, are so connected without me necessarily trying to make them connected it just right. is um and I think I feel natural in your work and yeah. your knack for detail is like just spot on <laughs> yeah thank you and I think to um okay last thought I promise um on this like I don't know how you felt Bo like in your research in terms of going back to Korea but like I part of a fellowship allowed me to go to Vietnam. Um, 
like during grad school. And I don't know what I was expecting, like some sense of homecoming or something. And that's not really what I experienced, not in a negative way, but it makes sense. You know, like it's my second time in Vietnam, the first time I was much younger. So, you know, I was much younger. Um, and this time a little bit more of an adult. Um, yeah, I don't know what I thought the feeling would be, you know, um, like, yes, maybe home, but at the same time, not, it just complicated like my feelings on what home is and like, um, and how America is also home, but at the same time, I don't know, it's a place of othering, but also going to Vietnam, like, I don't want to say other, that's too strong of a word, but also I didn't grow up there. And it's very obvious and very clear that I didn't grow up there. Um, partly also because of the, the language, um, a little bit of the language barrier for me. So. Yes. Yeah, I can relate to that too. I wasn't sure what I was going to feel either when I went back to South Korea and my emotions were very intense. Did you have that feeling too? Like there was a kind of, I guess, rawness or intensity to being in the physical space of my heritage and where I'm from. And did you have that experience of intensity that comes through in your work? Yeah, I, I think so a little bit. I don't know why. Maybe I thought going to Vietnam would like answer all my questions, even though I didn't know what questions I had and like, it didn't, you know, obviously there's more work to be done. Um, so yeah, that was definitely, I guess, a surprise in a, in a sense. Um, well, thank you all so much for sharing your poetry um, and for that discussion. Um, you're all incredible poets. I love all, all of your, the, the imagery that you all use, the sense of like place, and time um, that is on like really present in all of your work um, that really comes through. Uh, so thank you. Uh, this question is for each of you. Um, what drew you to poetry specifically as a medium and why did you feel that um, these books, um, the stories that you're telling here, why was poetry the best medium for that? I can start if y'all want. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep it short because like, who knows what the real answer to that is. It's like, just, it just felt right, you know? Um, but I think like, I can try to take a step back and say, and like, look at why I made the decisions that I made from this vantage point. And I think um, the the only other genre that might have come close to allowing me to explore the history and how I felt about it simultaneously, I think would have been maybe the lyric narrative. Um, <clears throat> but you know so well yeah I'll end I'll end it there but the so you know now I'm just going off I don't know I don't know it was poetry <laughs> never mind <laughs> jump in someone please save me <laughs> I appreciate the the honesty because yeah like I think I have an answer but I'm like is it the answer is it I don't know um I will say though that um I feel like I've been saying this a lot but like or recently, just because I think this question has come up before, but um, I didn't love poetry. Like when I first, maybe not the, when I first encountered it when I was younger, but in school, like high school and stuff, like we had to analyze and read poetry. I didn't love poetry because I did not understand it. And even though I have an MFA in poetry, there's still plenty of poems that I don't understand or like it takes a lot of work. And now I'm willing to do the work before I was just like, I'm dumb. I'm going to shut down and like poetry isn't for me. And I read a lot of fiction growing up. So I just assumed, because I always wanted to be a writer, I just assumed it would be fiction because that's mostly what I read. Um, and then when I went to college and took my first intro to creative writing class in college, um, I don't know, something with poetry just clicked. Not that I was writing amazing poetry in undergrad, like, like as a freshman, because I wasn't, but something just clicked in terms of um, maybe the way I think. And I don't know, hopefully I can come to fiction in the future or nonfiction, but I have a hard time writing like linear, linear, linearly, or like thinking of plot, you know? Um, and I think if I'm thinking of memory and like how fragmented it is, like, I don't know, I just saw more freedom in poetry to experiment, at least at the time. Um, yeah, I see Bo, you're like super nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, I really feel that too, just the, the element of freedom. And um, I resonated with something you said earlier, Susan, where poetry drew you in because it helped you to find these questions you didn't even know that you had. And so I really felt that way with poetry too, that especially as an adoptee, there were a lot of questions I had, but they were so taboo that sometimes I wouldn't 
acknowledge them within myself and poetry I didn't know what I was going to write or where the poem was going to go and so it each poem was a surprise and it showed me something a layer or revealed something as an adoptee I love that poetry as a discovery process um that's that's how it feels to me too which is why it's difficult to even speak to what happens right when you're but I also um, really love writing in form and then exploding it, but like using form as a vehicle to access my thoughts. I don't always like land the, like the landing, stick the landing, right? Like the form kind of dissolves sometimes, but um, you know, rather than like a chunk of prose, working with line breaks, working with, with re even received or traditional forms, like helps me access a part of my, of that brain work that, you know, maybe isn't like right at the surface. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely beautiful answers. Um, let's see, um, who are um, your biggest influences? Who are the poets um, that you admire the most? And was there anything in particular that you were reading while working on your respective books? I'm just ooing at that question. That's a fun one. But someone else should go first this time. <laughs> okay, I guess I can finally go first. Um, I'm sorry, I think I forgot the first part of the question, but it sounds like who or inspirations, it sounds like. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to answer in, in some ways. Um, I know when I was in grad school near the end of grad school and I was working on some of this collection I was actually taking an undergraduate course like outside of the MFA um like in our Asian American Pacific Islander studies program um it was like a like intro to contemporary not even contemporary just intro to like literature you know um and that was really important to me because I was like I need to read more like Asian American Pacific Islander authors right like I'm getting some in the program but like not as much as I realize I would want or like should be and I didn't even read my first Vietnamese American poet until grad school or like I don't I'm pretty sure because I wasn't actively thinking about it right um, and because they weren't necessarily in my classes and I wasn't actively thinking about it um I wasn't really reading that many like Vietnamese or even Asian American voices um that's something I try to do now um they've really like some I guess off the top of my head, people I think of is Kathy Lynn Shea, um, uh, who wrote Split, and Ocean Vuong, who wrote, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name, um, Night Sky with Exit Wounds was his first poetry collection, and he has another one coming out, and like has written a novel, and all these amazing things. Um, like we talk, we write about some of the same themes, but it's not just that, it's also the fact that I, I saw someone else, like a Vietnamese American poet, um, like writing and doing the thing and people cared, right? Like people made space for this. Um, I don't wanna say like it gave me permission because I don't think that's really what I mean, but I think just being able to see that and realize, okay, like I wanna be another, I guess, voice, right? Out there. Um, Cause there are, like there are a lot of varied experiences, especially in the Vietnamese diaspora and how many are really out there, right? Um, especially now that I'm searching for them um, and maybe there were some when I was younger and I wasn't looking for it, which is possible. Um, but maybe I feel like not as many as there could be or should be, right? Um, for whatever reason, you know, painful memories, like lack of access, like not spending time on art because survival and all those things. And I feel very lucky that like I am where I am and was able to write in and publish this book. I really loved Split. Um, it's a beautiful book um, by Kathy Lin Chi, right? Is that, yeah, okay. Um, it's been a while since I read it, but I thought it was really, really moving. Um, I'm gonna like go go old school and like bring up a dead white lady. <laughs> uh, Marion Moore is probably like one of the first poets who like really made me wanna write poetry. Um, Cause she just like did these weird, somersaults of thought on the page that like as an undergrad like when I was really getting serious about poetry I was really captivated right um so um and 
Avan Jordan's Quantum Lyrics for somebody more um, contemporary, I think really got me thinking about science and poetry and the intersection of science and poetry and what it has to do with, what it can have to do with storytelling. Um, yeah. I loved Split too, and also Ocean Vaughn. Ocean Vaughn's work, just gorgeous. Um, I loved uh, some female poets while I was writing this book and um, Stag's Leap by Sharon Olds. Lamont's Bright Dead Things. I loved that book. Um, Mary Oliver, I just couldn't read enough of her. And um, I love Lee Young Lee's Rose. Um, well, thank you all so much. Um, is there anything, um, like any closing thoughts that any of you would like to leave our audience with in the last couple minutes we've got here? Um, I just want to say thank you for those watching and thank you Salem and thank you Bo and Sarah again just for like being in the space but also the conversation we've had because I've read both your books and they're beautiful so it's wonderful to hear you reading some of the work um, but I really love the conversation we had um, so thank you for your thoughtful questions and it's really cool I know some themes that we all kind of write about but in such different ways and the ways that you do our work yeah. is so different um, but there are also some like Constellations, right? Like some connecting points. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that we could have this conversation and just kind of open up those doors. Oh, me too. It makes the like insular art of poetry feel less insular, right? Um, can we buy both of your books from um, Weller Bookworks? Or, yeah, yeah okay. Yes, yes. So I just, I'll, I'll, I'll I want to plug everyone's books. That. Buy them. <laughs> yes, you can, you can buy all three of the books. Ah, mine too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I really look forward to reading your book. Um, I got to get on it. I got to order it. I hope everyone else does too. Thank you guys so much. It's so wonderful being here with you, with all of you to be. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Salem. Thanks, poets. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, and definitely please check out their books. I'll be leaving links where you can get them as soon as we get off this Zoom call. Um, but yeah, okay. thank you all. This was an absolute treat. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.